Thank you, Evelyn. Um, I guess I'll start out with a, a couple of uh, comments that are sort of uh, defensive or something. I don't know. Um, so we are not weavers, um, and we are not historians. Um, we have both taken some weaving classes, um, but we're not, we don't consider ourselves weavers, and we certainly don't consider ourselves historians. Um, but we are collectors. Um, some might call us hoarders or pack rats. Uh, we prefer the term collector. And we enjoy researching local history. Um, most of the photos that I'm showing today and the coverlets that I'm show illustrating today are from our own collection, unless there is another note on the screen. So I'm going to do most of the talking. Um, but Mary Jean will be chiming in at any point that uh, she would like to add something. And as Evelyn mentioned, I'm fine with um, questions interrupting along the way. That'll, that'll be just fine. So it's going to be sort of in two parts. Um, initially, I'll review what we mean by coverlet. And then we'll get into a bit of the history of two weavers who wove in what is today Interlaken, but at one point was called Farmerville. So this was our first coverlet. Um, as Evelyn mentioned in the, in the introduction, um, we were at an estate sale in Interlaken, and um, I was ready to leave. Um, Mary Jean's still pawing through a pile of textiles, and uh, she came up with those two wonderful um, late 18th century, perhaps early 19th century, whole cloth quilts, and this coverlet. Um, we didn't know much about coverlets, but that was where what got us started, and we then started learning about coverlets. So first of all, what is a coverlet? Well, as Evelyn mentioned, generally speaking, it's a woven bed cover. But there are other kinds of bed covers as well, besides coverlets. What comes to mind first, perhaps, is a quilt. Um, a quilt is usually pieced fabric with then a top layer and a lower layer and some sort of a batting in between. And those layers are held together either with um, quilting or with just tying the top and bottom letter, leather, le layers together. Um, but the distinction is that coverlets are actually woven as the uh, fabric and they're, they're not pieced together the way um, quilts are. So typically, and I'm going to make a lot of generalizations because um, there's exceptions to just about everything that I say, um, but typically there is a center field. So what you're seeing here, I don't know if you can see my marker here, so a center field with a pattern that often repeats and often it has got a border on three sides and a corner box in two sides. So that's the most common and the most typical um, of the many different types of coverlets that we're going to be talking about today. So there's, as I mentioned, usually two corner blocks. And here you see, <coughs> excuse me, uh, part of the border um, on the, on the left one, part of the border on the one side, part of the border on the other side, actually this would be the end, and then the corner block there. And then on the right, uh, you also see there's border on the two sides, and the corner block in this case actually has um, text woven into it. In this case, um, this was woven um, by a weaver named Impson in 1839 in Cortland County, and it was woven for Catherine Ann Smith. But we'll get into that a little bit more later. So the coverlets are often in two separate panels. So they were woven in two separate panels and then stitched together to form the full width that would fit on a bed. So in this particular case, you can see the center seam isn't quite matching up the two patterns. So that was a challenge. Um, for the weavers to try to weave it in a manner that the patterns would actually um, 
match up. So here's an example, and this was taken at the National Museum of the American Coverlet, an example of a, a coverlet that is still all in one continuous strip. So this would then eventually have been cut down the middle, right there, and these two sides would be stitched together. You can see the, the corner block over here and a corner block over here, um, which is put it together in a correct way. Not all coverlets are in two panels, but many of them. We actually have some, occasionally you'll see them, particularly from the south, where they were uh, three panels. So what's wrong with this coverlet? So when somebody stitched the two panels together, they put the borders in rather than matching up the center field pattern. So you can see actually the corner blocks are not in the corners, they're in the middle. So sometimes there's fringes on the coverlets. Um, here's several examples with fringes. Um, the uh, one on the, the left you see is from Niagara County. Um, that's a New York coverlet. It's pretty uncommon to see the three colors that you see on that coverlet from New York, but it does happen occasionally. And then you see a couple of other different types of uh, fringes that would uh, be on the coverlets. Also, the, the fibers that are used for weaving coverlets are typically wool and cotton. The cotton would have typically been either natural or uh, perhaps bleached white. Um, and the, any of the colors would typically have been the wool fibers. So on the left you can see the three different colors on that one and in the upper right there's many different colors mixed into that one um, and that, the dyed fabric would, or fibers would typically have been um, wool. So we can divide the patterns that are found in coverlets into sort of two general categories. On the left you see the geometric, so the pattern is just geometric. On the right you see that it's more figured, there's more imagery, recognizable imagery there. We refer to those as figured and fancy or sometimes just as figured. So in order for, to weave uh, geometric like you see on the left there, that could typically have been done on a loom that many people had in their homes. So been a, a four, four shaft or four heddle loom um, that, that people could have wo woven that kind of, of um, coverlet pattern. And typically it would have been the females in the home that, who did that. On the right, in order to get that more figured look, um, you would have to have some sort of a, a loom attachment that was much more complex that would allow you to control each individual warp thread when you're weaving. And um, most commonly referred to is the jacquard uh, loom uh, attachment. That was uh, developed by jacquard in France in about 1804 for the silk industry and uh, it came to the United States sometime in the 1820s and got uh, used by many different types of weavers, including uh, coverlet weavers. Um, the fact that you needed that extra loom attachment basically meant that um, it would have been used primarily by professional weavers. So weavers who were, were uh, earning some or all of their income by weaving um, rather than being done in the home where um, it would have not been very cost effective to have to acquire that extra. So there were also other types of attachments that could go on a loom that would um, allow figured weaving like that. Uh, one of them is referred to as a barrel loom. So think of the uh, music box and the cylinder with the little pegs on it. The same principle, only the little pegs would have controlled the individual uh, warps, uh, warp threads, moving them up and down to control, control the pattern. Um, so far, there, while we have record of, of uh, barrel looms, there, as far as I know, aren't any known barrel looms um, 
in, in North America that have been saved. Most of them went to the barn and then went to the burn pile probably. So the jacquard uh, loom attachment was actually controlled by punch cards. And yes, this is the predecessor of the 20th century computer. Um, so those holes were what determined the pattern of the individual warp threads that were being pulled. And that's about as much of the explanation as I can come up with on how it works. We've seen one in operation. Um, they're pretty amazing. Um, and on the right, you can see um, up at the top here where the cards are being fed through the loom attachment at the top to control the, uh, the warp threads. So here's a small selection of geometric patterns. Um, you see there's a, quite a bit of variation and of course this is just a sampling. You can see um, this one here has almost what we would call trees. Sometimes we coverlet enthusiasts do call those trees. But for the most part it's just a geometric pattern rather than representing any image of anything. So here's a little bit more about some of the geometric um, coverlets. So there are geometric coverlet is the pattern, but there are different weave structures that can produce geometric patterns. And in this particular weave structure is referred to as overshot, sometimes referred to as float work. And there are several examples in the room um, that are labeled for those people who are here. You can take a look at those a little bit more closely. And if you look closely, you'll see why it's called overshot or float work, um, where the weft uh, yarns actually leap over several of the, uh, the warp, yar warp yarns, um, so it looks like it's sort of floating over the others. Again, though, this is an example where you see <clears throat> the, the repeated pattern in a center field, and again, I'm only showing a portion of the, the coverlet, um, with a border. This would have been on three sides. This is one corner. Um, so, and the, on these, the border pattern is some subset repeated from the center field pattern. So they take just a segment of it, or a couple of segments of it, and just keep repeating it over and over again to get this border pattern that distinguishes it from the center field pattern. And that's different in the than in the, uh, the figured ones that we'll come across later. So here in the upper left is an overshot, but it actually has a woven date in it, date and initials, and that's very uncommon. Very few of the weavers who were doing um, overshot coverlets um, had the know-how to actually weave a date or letters or text in general in. The lower right is what's more common where you would see uh, an overshot that had a stitched on date and initials. So that, that's, that's more what you would likely to see. Um, we actually have this one with the woven in date on display today, so you can take a look at that, those of you who are in the room. Now this is a geometric pattern, but it, the weave structure is different. This is called a double weave or double cloth. It's actually two layers of cloth in essence. So there would have been two sets of warp threads, um, in this case a dark blue and a white, the dark blue being wool and the white being cotton. Um, and this is the, the, um, the white is the opposite side of this. This is the same coverlet. So you can see that it, they're the same pattern, but um, they're essentially a mirror in terms of the, the colors. So this would have required again a more sophisticated uh, loom to, to do a double weave um, coverlet like this and so this would have probably been woven by a professional weaver as well but it wouldn't have required necessarily like a, a jacquard uh, loom attachment. So this is yet another uh, weave structure it's referred to as summer winter. Um, you can see the other, the other uh, coverlet was pretty white on the white part. Um, this is sort of fuzzy or cloudy. Um, but this, so this is a different weave structure. 
Um, so it's referred to as summer winter, which is actually a weave structure. Sometimes people refer to any coverlet that has a dominant white light color side and a dominant dark colored side as summer winter. And that's a misuse of that term. Um, the summer winter is actually a, a uh, weave structure rather than a more generic term like that. So here are the two side by side that we just saw, the double weave and the summer winter. You can see the patterns are actually quite different. Or, I'm sorry, the pattern's quite the same, um, but you can see the difference in some of the weave structure if you could see that up close. So this is pushing the limits of a geometric pattern. Um, you're starting to see some imagery. In this case, uh, looks like cathedrals. Um, so Again, this would have taken uh, a professional to pull this off um, and a rather sophisticated loom that he could have that much control to create something like that. So Marty, I have a question. Sure. If you want me to just shout them out. Um, Christian wonders, was Lindsay Woolery used as well as wool and cotton? Um, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Um, I don't know about Lindsay Woolsey, but linen was was used as a fiber actually probably earlier um, than cotton. So in, the, in our part of the country, of course, um, linen was available before cotton was available. And so, but linen was a lot of hard work to produce both in terms of growing and convert and, and producing the linen um, thread or yarn itself. So as soon as cotton started being available, which was pretty early, people tended to switch to, to, uh, to cotton. Um, instead of using linen. So do, we have one example here in, um, on display that's actually linen and wool. Thank you. So now we get into the figured and fancy. Um, so notice the substantially more detailed imagery that you see there. Um, this would have required the loom attachment that I was describing before, or a loom attachment. Uh, it could have been jacquard, could have been a barrel loom, could have been another type of loom attachment that would allow this kind of uh, control in detail. Um, this one though is also double weave like we talked about before. Um, so the, the two sides would be um, mirror in terms of their pattern and then their um, colors. Um, but once you get into the figured fancy, it actually allows more easily the weaving of text. So that's why we can more likely to see in a corner block that there would be text. In this case, um, this was woven for Mary Lacherette, and it was woven in Tyrone, which is a town, a very small town over in Seneca County, I'm sorry, in Schuyler County. <clears throat> and it was woven in 1834, and beyond, below the date you see the initials HL, and those are the initials of the weaver. It was Henry, Henry Lacherette. Um, I actually haven't checked to see what the relationship between Mary Lacherette and Henry is. There were quite a few Lacherettes in the area. The Lacherettes were actually a large family of weavers in New York and in Indiana. Um, in New York, Henry Lacherette and David Lacherette were, were uh, weavers in the 1830s and 40s. So this is another um, figured in fancy, but the uh, weave structure is called tied biterwan. You might not be able to see it very well on the upper right, but in the lower left you can see those vertical lines, um, which is an which is, uh, indication of the, the weave structure. Um, and in the upper right, um, if you look at the, the white part at least, you can see those vertical lines as well. So that's an indication of the um, tied biter wand as a weave structure. In this case, this one was woven for Elizabeth Reynolds. It was woven by J.M. Davidson, who calls himself a fancy weaver. Um, and it was woven in Lodi, New York, in Seneca County in 1839. So this is now what's referred to as true biter wand. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see those vertical lines in the lower right-hand corner, 
um, it looks much more like a double weave, um, especially on the, on the white part. Um, it doesn't have those vertical lines, and so that's um, what we refer to as true bite wine. There, there are other names for some of these, so different, different uh, uh, people in the, in the field sometimes use different names, but these are the ones I'm using today. So this one was woven for Lucinda France um, in 1856, and it was attributed to Harry Tyler, who wove mostly in northern New York, in Jefferson County, but also in some other parts of the state. And he was very prolific um, and well-known uh, weaver. Um, but you can see also that there's other text besides a personal name, a weaver's name, a place name, a date. Um, it gets, uh, you could sometimes get into um, political or patriotic statements. Sometimes there's statements about uh, the quality of their work or something like that. So to summarize, what is a coverlet? It's a woven bed cover. It's usually a center field pattern with a border on three sides. Corner block usually in two corners. Often it's two panels stitched together in the center. Sometimes there's a fringe. Usually it's wool and cotton. Sometimes it's wool and, and uh, linen. Sometimes it's wool and wool. Um, two sort of general categories of patterns are geometric and figured in fancy. We saw several different weave structures. There are others beyond those that I've mentioned. It's common for two colors. That's the most common. Um, in New York, those two colors are blue and white, though sometimes there's red and white. The peak period for weaving coverlets like these are the 1830s through the 1850s. So here are some of the places in our area where, we docu where coverlet weavers have been documented. And if you look over that, a lot of those are pretty small places. Uh, so it's interesting, a lot of the weavers were working in very small towns, especially if you think about 1830s and 1840s, the towns were pretty small. Here's a map, all the place names that are in red had a coverlet weaver at some point in the early 19th century. And there's probably more that, that um, are known that I haven't put up there, but there are also some that I just haven't been documented yet. So I'll give you a taste of some of the uh, corner blocks, at least, on some of the uh, coverlets. Um, these are all woven by Archibald Davidson in Ithaca. And the upper left-hand corner, 1833, Toward the earlier part of his uh, weaving, he wove from 1831 to 1849. Um, you see he's just got his name listed there, A. Davidson Weaver. Um, then we go down to the one below, which is 1840, a couple of years later. He's calling it woven at the Ithaca Carpet Factory. So I mentioned, I believe, that um, there were many different things often woven by the coverlet weavers. They weren't just weaving um, coverlets. Carpets and coverlets were probably the most, combination, the most common combination that they would weave, but there were plenty of other textiles that they would weave in many cases as well. And over on the right, you see uh, a red and white example from Archibald Davidson, the Ithaca Carpet Factory, and then up in the upper right is another um, blue and white with a, a different uh, pattern um, on that one. A little bit um, more in the area. So we've got in the upper left-hand corner, uh, J.M. Davidson we saw before weaving in Lodi. He also wove in Ovid. Um, what I'm not sure of is whether he moved, but I do know that the boundaries between Ovid and, and, uh, and uh, Lodi have changed over time. So it's possible that he was in the same place and just the, the town that he was in changed. Um, I have to do some more work on that. Um, and then on the lower left, you see J.M. Davidson that we saw before from Lodi. The middle at the bottom is Varick, New York, also in Seneca County. The weaver there was uh, Thomas Sinclair. Um, 1837, he must have been practicing. You can see the seven is upside down. A little, little hard sometimes to get those letters to come out right. Lower right, um, Hectorville. Um, done a lot of research 
couple of colleagues and I looking for where Hectorville was, and we found no historic use of that. Uh, but based on who we believe the weaver was and who the recipient was, the D at the bottom was for David Lacherette, and he wove in Hector, so we think that this was some sort of a colloquial name or something for Hector was colloquial, was uh, Hectorville. It seems odd to me because it's more text you'd have to weave um, in, but uh, somebody, there are at least two known coverlets that say Hectorville on them. This is in the personal collection of Kitty Bell and Ron Walter, um, who is one of my researcher and collector colleagues. The one in the upper right is by John Simmermaker, or I'm sorry, is in his collection. Um, and that was woven for Sarah Lotterette, or S. Lotterette, I don't know if it was Sarah, I think it was, uh, in Farmerville in 1833, and at the bottom you see the name Beatty as the weaver. Continuing a little further afield in the upper left-hand corner, there's a coverlet that doesn't have a, a, a weaver name and it doesn't have a, a, a place name, but we've located it as coming from Phelps, New York in Ontario County based on the name that is woven there and that would have been woven for Isaac Burgess and we found out that in the mid 19th century he lived in, in uh, Phelps and we knew there were weavers in the Phelps area. In the lower left is Scipio, so Cuga County on the east side of, of uh, Canandaigua Lake up uh, Canandaigua, Cayuga Lake, um, and, the, and on the right, um, lower right, we saw this before, Cortland, and then in the upper right, Groton, which is um, in Tompkins County. There was a lot of weaving activity in uh, Groton. The Conger family, uh, there was a whole family of weavers, in-laws that were weavers that spread around the state. In fact, um, they did some patenting of weave uh, loom attachments as well. So here are a couple from Schuyler County, um, all small burgs where these were woven. Monterey in the upper left hand corner, uh, Tyrone, Redding, and Orange, um, all woven in, uh, in Seneca County. I'm sorry, Schuyler County. Yet further afield, you see Orleans County in the upper left. In the lower left is Clinton, the weaver there. Um, B. French um, and Clinton counties, or Clinton is in Oneida County. The lower right, Southport, which is Elmira area. Um, and then in the upper right, uh, Niagara County, we saw that image before. So it was in 2014 when Mary Jean and I visited the National Museum of the American Coverlet and their exhibit, they had this coverlet on display that was in the personal collection of John Simmermaker, who is from Indiana. It says, S. Lotterette, Farmerville, 1833, Beattie. I knew that the former name of Interlaken was Farmerville. And this had a lot of the traits of a New York uh, patterns and so this caught my interest and I started uh, researching it. Um, I was um, bugging him, trying to get him to sell it to me, um, but he refused um, to let me bring it home to Interlaken. Um, but I started researching um, and one of the ways to find information about the, the weavers of the time is advertisements in the newspapers of that time period. So on the left, there's a, an advertisement. Um, it's in the Trumansburg newspaper, uh, but it's, the business is in Farmerville. And this was by Lewis Abbott. And you can see there's a variety of things there that he says that he weaves. Um, and this is in 1835. Um, so there was a, another weaver in, in um, Farmerville during the mid 30s, um, but this is not I didn't see any mention of Beattie, excuse me, so I had to keep looking and I found several issues of the newspaper in 1833 that had the ad on the right which mentioned a Beattie and Sarine um, as the weavers, also noting that it is um, in Farmerville. You can see there also there's quite a diversity of um, things that they weave, not just coverlets, but they do mention patent coverlets. So he had a patented um, loom attachment in order to weave coverlets. 
So there were no newspapers in Farmerville um, during that time period. So the nearest newspapers would have been um, Trumansburg and Ovid. Um, so hence this one showing up in the Trumansburg newspaper. So I had some hints on who the weavers were um, in, in uh, Farmerville. I have a beady here and also there is a Sarine mentioned. Now Sarine is a name that is relatively common in that general area into, down into Hector as well. Um, and I talked to some family members and they said there are no weavers in the Sarine family. So I didn't get anywhere um, with those local connections. Um, the first sort of connection that I made was actually on RootsWeb, which a genealogy site that I'm not sure is even functioning anymore. Um, and I found two sisters in the Wheeler family. One married a William Beatty and another one married a Mephisbosheth Sarine. And that's the last time I'm going to try to pronounce his name. He'll be Mr. Sarine for the rest of the talk. Um, though I guess he was also referred to as Basha at times. Um, in any event, I thought, well, there must be some connection between these two, so maybe those are indeed the first names of the Beatty and Sarine in the advertisement. So it got me going a little bit, and I found out that um, the Wheeler family was living in the town of Lodi, or I'm sorry, Ovid, so they were nearby. Um, so it started, started fitting together a little bit. Further research at the uh, Seneca County Clerk's Office, I found that William Beatty brought pro bought property in Farmerville in 1833. So that sort of placed him in Farmerville area as well in some historic documentation. And, um, but it was in 1834, I found a record that William Beatty and his wife, and Mr. Sarine and his wife, sold the property on Main Street in 1834, just the next year. Um, so it led me to believe that neither of them were in the area very long. I started digging into uh, Sarine partly because he had such an unusual first name it was easier to, uh, to zero in on, on him when doing online searches. Um, and I found a, a directory that he was listed in a New York City directory um, in, from 1836 to 1839. Um, so he had left sometime um, before 1836 from Farmerville and gone to New York City. I found record later that um, his daughter was born in 1835 in, in, uh, in New York City. So uh, probably um, it was down there at least by then and maybe, maybe even before that. So here are some other tidbits that we found about um, Mr. Sarine. Uh, he was born in Dutchess County, New York. Um, he was the third child of Isaac Sarine and Sarah Hannah Garrison. He accompanied his family to Hector in 1821 when he was 10 years old. The family story is that he was a friend as a youth with Joseph Smith. The family returned to Dutchess County about 1830 when he was 19. There's documentation that the two older brothers did stay in this area. Um, and he apparently did as well for at least a short time since between 1830 and 1833 and 4, he was showing up in that advertisement. He married Maria Wheeler in Ovid. In a letter, he states that he was in New York City by 1833, so he was really short-lived short here in, uh, in Seneca County or in this area. Um, he's listed as a carpet weaver in New York City for those years. He was an active member of the Mormon Church and he was a missionary to Michigan, Connecticut, Great Britain, and other places. And he died on a riverboat in Ohio River in 1848. So we don't know a whole lot about him, but I was able to glean a little bit more about him because he was active in the Mormon Church and they tend to do a lot of genealogy, family history research, and so there I was able to find things on their site about him. So, but questions remain. Where did he learn to weave? He was born in Dutchess County, New York, and there were weavers there, but he would have been only 10 years old when he, the family moved from Dutchess County up to this area. 
I suppose he could have been an apprentice at 10. Um, but why wasn't his name on the coverlets? We'll get to that shortly. You probably haven't noticed that yet. Um, the advertisement said Beatty and Sarine, but the property was owned by both. So for some reason, his name didn't get on the coverlets. And then why did he leave Seneca County? He continued weaving. So it's not like he was changing professions or something like that. So sometimes when you do research, you end up with more questions than you started with. So a little bit about William Beatty. Um, he was also uh, perhaps even more difficult to track down. We found out that he was born in um, 1808 in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, could he have learned to weave in Bucks County? There were definitely weavers in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, coverlet weavers. Uh, 1825, he had a daughter born in New York State. Um, but where in New York State, we don't know. In 1827, he was married in New York. I don't know if that was his first marriage or his second marriage. Um, in 1830, he had a daughter born in New York, um, but again, I don't know where. Um, in the 1830 census, I couldn't find him for sure. There were a couple of William Beatties in Orange County, New York, but the dates didn't really match up, um, dates and the ages of the people. 1832 to 1834, we've documented him as a weaver in Farmerville. 1833, purchased property. 1834, he and Sarine and their wives sold property in Farmerville. By 1835, the records show that he had a daughter born in Michigan, so he already was leaving the area and going to Michigan um, at that point. And in the 1840 census, he shows up um, in Livingston County, Michigan. So here is the... Uh, Farmerville coverlet that um, Mary Jean and I now own. Um, I mentioned the one that um, John Simmermaker had in um, um, an exhibit in Bedford, PA, and I was bugging him about it, and so he knew I was interested. Um, he's a great collector and a great guy. And a couple of months ago, I got a phone call from him. He was at an antique show in, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and he said, Marty, I've come across a Farmerville coverlet. Do you want it? And it was easy enough for me to say yes. And uh, so he purchased it and shipped it out to me um, after that. So uh, we now have a Farmerville coverlet uh, closer to home where it started. So there are now six documented coverlets that were woven in Farmerville. Um, this is the sixth up until this one. Uh, in 1834 that we just acquired, um, there were only five known. Um, these are the corner blocks, the best images that I could come up with because some of the documentation that I came across um, was quite old and the, the uh, images were not great. Um, this is a little different way to see those six coverlets. So 1832, um, that one that was pictured there is formerly in the DeWitt Historical Society, now known as the History Center in Tompkins County. Um, they had last documented it, I believe, in the very early 1980s and since then have not found it on any of their inventory, so they're not sure where it went. If it got deaccessioned, that the records weren't there in the deaccession records. Um, another one in 1832 was made for Elizabeth Boardman um, and I found documentation from the 1970s, I believe it was, that it was in the Boardman family, uh, but I wasn't able to actually determine who has it now. 1833, uh, that's the one that John Simmermaker has. 18, another 1833, this one we'll be focusing on a little bit more. The initials of the recipient are GWVD, then Farmerville, and then in the place at the bottom of the corner block where we usually are seeing the name of the weaver are the initials B and VD. This particular coverlet is in the Alling Coverlet Museum in Palmyra. There is an 1834 coverlet in the Winterthur Museum. And there is the 1834 that we recently acquired. So, Something to sh look at right now, we're going to focus a little bit on the, um, the, uh, this one here, the 1833 with the initials on it. But notice the first three have full name of Beatty 
at the bottom of the corner block um, as the, in the place where Weaver's name would be. This one has B and VD in 1833. And then the next two that are in 1834 just have B. Um, so they didn't go back to, or he didn't go back to putting full name of BD on there. He removed apparently the and VD and just kept the B uh, for the remaining coverlets that we know about. So this is the one that has the initials GWVD in the corner block. It is actually a child size coverlet. It's not a full size coverlet. So what you see there is the whole thing. Um, what we have asserted is that this was woven for Garrett William Van Dorn. That's what the initials stand for at the top. We'll actually look at it over here in the upper right. And apparently it was woven sort of collaboratively between William Beattie and Garrett William Van Dorn. And that's why we have the B and VD, the initials of two weavers participating in this. And here you see in the lower right hand corner, the next year, 1834, the initials are dropped out, the, v, the B and VD, or I'm sorry, the ampersand and the VD and just the B is kept. So apparently BD was weaving at least one or two more where just those initials are there. So the suspicion is that um, Garrett William Van Dorn, who was from New Jersey and was from a family of weavers, including coverlet weavers, came up and worked with William Beatty in Farmerville for a while and probably acquired his equipment when he stopped weaving in 1834 was the last known one. So on the left we see one of the Beatty coverlets. On the right we see one of the Garrett William Van Dorn coverlets. Um, when he was weaving, oops, um, when he was weaving in Millstone, New Jersey. So 1834, um, and the last one in Farmerville was 1834. So my guess is that he took at least the, the um, um, loom attachment with him back to New Jersey to use. So the, the overall pattern is just very similar. The borders, the center field, the layout of the, of the corner block is very, very similar. So that's, that's our that's our uh, suspicion um, on what happened there. So that's basically the story of the weavers in, in Farmerville, which is now Interlaken. Um, very short lived um, venture um, by Beatty and apparently some of the time by Serine. Um, I would encourage you to uh, visit and support coverlet collections. Um, the Alling Coverlet Museum is the, the, the nearby in Palmyra. They have a very large collection and usually have quite a few on display. The National Museum of the American Coverlet in Bedford, PA, is another very large collection. The Colonial Coverlet Guild of America is more a collector and coverlet enthusiast, not a collection per se. Um, the McCarl Coverlet Gallery at St. Vincent College in La Trobe, PA um, has got a significant collection as well. Um, Cornell Fashion and Textile Collection has several coverlets in their collection. And most and many, or at least many of the local and regional historical societies and museums will have at least a couple of coverlets in their collection. I will also mention that um, and, and uh, Evelyn mentioned this as well. I've started a coverlet study group. We meet once a, once a month online. Um, there's usually a, a presentation at the beginning and then it goes into question and answers and discussion. Um, and if you're interested in participating in that, please be in touch or you can, you can find uh, how to sign up at the Interlaken Public Library uh, through their events page um, because they're hosting our Zoom session for us. Now, there are over 130 names on the list, over 20 states that are represented um, who, who uh, participate in this.
coverlet study group. So thank you to the many people who contributed to my research and my interest, um, as well as to Mann Library for hosting this, and um, all of you for participating both in person and remotely, and I'd be happy to try to answer some questions. Mary Jean. I got to tell the story about the cow. Oh, I did. <laughs> um, so there were, I've, I've researched coverlet weavers in a number of the small, small towns I think I mentioned, and um, there are a lot of good stories in some of these, um, but I ended up choosing to talk about uh, Farmerville today. Um, so one of the stories that she was mentioning, um, Paul Galtry, who was a weaver in, in uh, Schuyler County, um, he, the family took one of his coverlets that had the Galtry name on it when they moved in the 1840s from New York to Indiana. And I don't know, maybe 10 years after that, they decided to move to Wisconsin. And they were ready to move to Wisconsin, they were all ready to go, and the cow that they were planning on taking with them died. So they found another cow to buy, but they didn't have the cash to buy the cow. So they ended up exchanging that coverlet for the cow with the understanding that if they came back in the future with the cash, they could get their coverlet back. And eventually they did. It stayed in the family until just a few years ago, the family donated it to the Schuyler County Historical Society. Um, so there are a number of interesting stories. Another one that uh, was sort of interesting is um, when I was researching the, the weaver in Varick, New York, in Seneca County, um, the, uh, I couldn't find him in the 1830 census and his wife was listed as the head of household. And it seemed a little confusing to me. Um, in 1830, they didn't list all of the individual names of the people, they just listed the head of household and it wasn't usually a woman that was listed as the head of a household. More research and I found out that in 1830, he was in the Auburn prison. And um, I think it was grand larceny I found, but that was about the only information that I could find about him. But if you're familiar with Auburn Prison, they had many different workshops uh, where the prisoners worked. And he was documented as a weaver in the Auburn Prison working in the weave shop. Now what I haven't been able to determine was, was he a weaver before he went in and continued weaving and then wove after? Because the coverlets that we have uh, documented from him from Varick were post his release from prison. Or perhaps he went to prison and that's where he learned to weave and then when he came back out, he actually was a practicing weaver. So I haven't been able to document that, but another sort of interesting twist on, um, on the story. Yeah, Jill? Well, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, maybe I missed this, but could you talk a little more about how they made the attachment with what I call the punch cards? I mean, that seems really, these are really complicated designs and back then, how would they do it? Um, I am certainly not an expert in that area. Um, so the approach that, that of controlling the loom with punch cards was developed by, what was his name, Jean-Marie Jacques, Jacques Card in France for the silk industry where they were, they were weaving complex patterns in their silk and he, among others, were looking for ways to improve the efficiency, and he came up with the idea of punch cards, I believe, and applying it there for, for that. So I can't explain how the punch card system actually works, um, but um, the punch cards are stitched together like you saw in, in a long stream, and they get fed through the loom attachment, and the holes that are in the card are what um, drives which of the warp threads get lifted and which ones go down in order to, so each, each warp thread is individually controlled, which is, gives you a lot of, lot of control over what kind of imagery you can end up being. And so they were punching the cards. I don't know if early on they had a sophisticated device for punching. Later on, there, you know, there were punch card 
businesses where you could buy your punch cards for your, for your loom. There were many others in the US that started manufacturing them and somehow had some variations on them that, that they were allowed, they were then available to, to patent their particular twist on it. But I can't really explain more than that. A little bit related to that then, who comes up with that design? It's a good question. Who came up with the design? Well, it's unclear. Um, in many cases, in some cases, I should say, the design actually came with the when you acquired the loom attachment. So if it was if it was a punch card system like the Jacquard, you probably got a, several batches of punch cards with it when you bought the the loom attachment. Um, Something like the barrel loom might have been the same manner, though it might, um, the barrel loom had more flexibility because you could simply pull out one of those pegs and put it in a little different place and change, change the, uh, change the uh, pattern uh, in only a very small way, um, in a very small incremental way. Um, I have one advertisement from a person in Auburn about this time period, I don't remember the date, where he actually billed himself as a pattern maker. Um, so I think that in some cases they were, um, you could acquire patterns. I think in some cases it's been, those people who are familiar with weaving um, and interpreting what you see on coverlets, they probably acquired the, the center field pattern and then they messed around with the border pattern because in some cases the center field pattern is very sophisticated and the border pattern or the corner blocks are very crude. So the weavers weren't necessarily good designers, um, but some of them were. Some of them were definitely the designers as well. Well, and some of the design patterns were by counter cross stitch, the way the, uh, the directions were counter cross stitch. So somehow, they can change that pattern that they drew to the blocks. Yeah. But there were certain weavers, wasn't it like um, Harry Tyler, who was like 80, I mean, he could do these and he would do them. I mean, he'd make the whole thing. He'd make the punch cards, he'd make the design on graph paper, which was pretty amazing. But there's also, um, if you Google Jacquard, I think, well, somehow you can get to Justin Scarraro's. Justin Squizero. Justin Squizero is a weaver in, in, um, in Vermont. It would be cool if he was watching today, but I doubt if he is. Uh, <laughs> but he has a jacquard loom that we visited and saw in operation. And at that point, he, was, he had this enormous piece of graph paper that he put together that he was working out the design um, for, the, for the coverlet that he was going to weave. And you can watch his jacquard machine in action. Yeah, he has, he has some great videos um, on his website and also on Instagram. Over here. Any idea on the production? Like, how long did it take and how much were they charging for these? I was afraid somebody was going to ask that question. <laughs> um, the coverlets typically were only a few dollars um, that, that they would sell them for, and it would have been more if you had your name put in it you know, and things like that. But um, um, the, the fancies, they were, they were relatively inexpensive. There are a few uh, coverlet weaver account books um, that are out there, and so that, that there is some documentation on who they went to and how much how much they were charged for the coverlets. Um, so there's a little bit of that out there that gives some sense. And it's hard to put a time amount on how long it took to weave a coverlet because probably the most time it was taking was to dress the loom in the first place and get it all set up. Um, and you would do that for you know, a number of coverlets or whatever you were weaving, you would, you would put enough warp on the loom so that you could do a whole bunch of them and then you would separate them after you you wove all of that. Um, were they all made to order? No, they were not all made to order. Um, it, it was sort of a special thing to have a coverlet made for you um, so that you see a fair amount and probably the reason why um, we have these is because they were personalized and they were kept as family heirlooms rather than used as a horse blanket, which is 
you know, what some of the others eventually got used for. Um, there were a lot of coverlets produced that were in, indeed fancy coverlets like this that had no name or date or anything on them. So they were much more like a production item that probably went to the general store or something like that. And you could buy, you could buy a coverlet that was more of a production type item um, and not personalized. So the, um, the ones for those in the room that we have on display here, sort of uh, the progression is similar to how I described the, the coverlets and the different um, patterns and weave structures. Um, and you're welcome to take a look at those um, later. And if you have any questions, ask Mary Jean or ask me when you're looking at them. But did I see there was another question? I was just going to ask if you calculated what couple dollars for a coverlet is in today's dollars. No, I haven't. No. But the other thing is you bring your own wool. That's true. Okay. Yeah. So um, a lot of the advertisements would say, you know, you bring your wool and here's how it needs to be spun, what the weight is, how much you need to provide in order to do a coverlet. Sometimes um, the weaver was the one who actually did the dyeing. So in the ad, it might say that they were doing the dyeing as well. Um, some of the coverlet weavers, the advertisement said they would take produce in trade. Um, so you know, we're talking the 1830s and 40s. Um, you know, it was a very different economy and not a whole lot of cash necessarily around. Is there a, like a functional or practical why for them being made in two panels and sewn together? So why were they two panels more commonly? Well, I th there were full width coverlets woven very early in the 1820s, maybe even earlier. Um, but a lot of the um, looms were narrower, so they didn't, they weren't wide enough. But also, if you think about it, you're throwing that shuttle from one side to the other. And that's a long ways to throw a shuttle. Um, and you'd basically probably need two people or something to go from one side and somebody catch it on the other side. And then you would change your, your treadling and then throw it back. Um, so it, it just was, I think, um, more effective or efficient um, for a single weaver to, to do it that way. Um, and as I mentioned, sometimes in the South, um, there were three panels. They were even a little bit narrower, and then there were three panels to get a, a full width. So this is uh, building on a question that you mostly answered about the colors that were used regionally, but maybe you could talk a little bit about why New York was mostly blue and white. Why was New York mostly blue um, and some red? I don't know for sure. Um, and unfortunately, this is being recorded, so I have to be careful because <laughs> um, somebody will come back at me. But I think probably it had something to do with the origin of the weaver and the availability of um, indigo as a blue dye. Um, many of the weavers in New York State were of the um, English-Scottish extraction. And they brought those skills with them in many cases. And I think that was part of the tradition that they were basically conveying what they, what they knew. Um, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, more of the weavers were Germanic. And um, they tended to use more different colors in, in their, not just different colors and different coverlets, but actually multiple colors in the same coverlet. Um, that's as much as I know at this point. Go ahead. What kind of dyes were used other than indigo? Um, red was often matter. Um, at some point, um, cochineal was available for red. Um, there are natural dyes as well. Um, if anybody is interested in dyeing, um, the Coverlet Study Group meets tomorrow online. And the topic is going to be two mid-19th century dye books that somebody has um, been looking into and comparing. Um, both of them were published by Conger Brothers uh, separately. Um, the Congers came from Groton, um, but the one Conger was weaving in Penyan. And um, 
He published a book with his nephew, Nathaniel Cass, I believe it was, um, and published in Penyan in, I think that one was 1857 or something like that, or maybe it was 48. And then there was another one of the brothers, of the Conger brothers published a separate one in um, the same time period, maybe within 10 years, but it was published in Fulton, New York. Um, and he had been weaving in Walcott. Um, so um, the speaker, uh, Gina Levesque, is going, she actually, she lives in Oklahoma. She's, she's going to, um, um, dig in and share what she's learned about that. So there were all sorts of dye instructions, um, different fibers, different methods for dyeing, and also applying some of that directly to carpet weaving or coverlet weaving. Um, a little bit of story about finding those two dye books. Um, a good friend of mine who is also a coverlet researcher, uh, Peter Jensen told me some years ago, that he knew about a dye book that had been published in Penyan. And I'm a librarian. I started digging and I found no record of a dye book published in Penyan um, by Conger. And um, so I went back to him and he said, well, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that I saw it one time um, that the curator of the Bedford Museum, the National Museum of the American Coverlet had a copy so the next time I was there, I approached her and she says, yeah, I think I've got that. And she pulled it out and showed it to me. And it's like, okay. But as far as we know, that's the only one. But in the process of me looking for it, I did find the other dye book that was published in, in Fulton. And the only copy that we know of there was in uh, Vassar College. Um, so those, those are the only two copies that we know of at this point. I have a question about um, it, it, it short-lived the, the, the it was short-lived I guess career that that Beatty and Sarine had. Um, I also noticed that they were advertising other kinds of weaving diapers. Was are they di we're talking diapers? Diaper as a weave type basically uh, as a, a as a weave okay. structure. Okay, I was just wondering how remunerative. I mean, how was it? Must have been. You know, it must have been a uh, n not very rewarding in terms of making a living. Was that was it a tough? Was it some of the, some of the weavers were in it for, you know, just a short time, and some of them were in for a decade or more. It it you know I think it varied. It partly their business skills probably, and partly their weaving skills, and partly the size of their population that they were catering to. Most of these, many of the weavers that you saw on the map here, were essentially getting their uh, loom attachment, they were purchasing the rights to use that loom attachment from the patent holder. Mm -hmm. And they were often restricted to a specific geographic area, often just a, a, um, an individual um, town. Um, and we have some documentation right here in the History Center in Ithaca um, where there's a copy of the patent license agreement where they were making it available to one person for a given town and there are a few of those around. So yeah in some respects they had a very limited audience especially since the the towns were pretty small but many of them also wove a variety of things um, not just not just coverlets. So who pulls the plug on me here? Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. What is that? I know that you said that Jacquard had, you know, he developed it for the silk industry earlier. Was the coverment strictly a, or the, the cotton wool coverment strictly an American thing? Or did it come from Europe with the immigrants? Or how? I mean, I, I never have heard of a coverlet from. I wish I had a better understanding of that. Um, Certainly many of the weavers brought their skills with them. Um, but somehow this did develop into sort of an American thing. Um, but there are some similarities. In fact, um, some people have done research on early German um, pattern books, um, 18th century and even earlier, 
and they were doing some of the same, um, you know, they were describing some of these patterns and weave structures um, back then. So um, that was coming, the combination of, of um, wool and cotton. Um, I suspect some of that was also happening in, in Europe, but I, I don't know that for sure. I think certainly there was, weaving has a very, very long history in, or throughout the world, um, but certainly most of the weavers of coverlets had a European tradition behind them. You're welcome.